Okay, I'm excited because, because this series we've been doing, series, whatever you want to call it, I, it's just very exciting to me as I'm, I'm just seeing things for the first time. But week one, which was August 5th, um, and you could you know, get on, online and take a look at these things, we pretty much tried to establish a foundation about the Shema. We pretty much established that it's, in, it's, a, it's a credo in Judaism. It's the watchword of Israel. Basically, it says that there's only one God. That's what it says. It, it, it basically is speaking about monotheism, that there is no other gods. There never was and there never will be. There's only one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we're to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, correct? Yeah. And so we established that, and, and we really, you know, we didn't beat a dead horse, but we spoke about it for an hour, and, and I think you should spend some time in the first week. Last week, we spoke about why it's important to love God with all our heart. What is the benefit? And the big benefit is, of course, he receives glory, but the side benefit is that we, we get a blessing from it as well, because God says it will go well with you if you walk in my ways. It's not for God. You know, when, when you tell a kid, look both ways when you cross the street, it's, it's not for the parent who's not crossing the street. It's for the kid who, who you, know, you, you know, doesn't want to get hit, right? Here's the question for week three. Is the Shema exclusive to the Jewish code of law in the Old Testament, or do Christians have a connection to the Shema as well? Okay, you got it? Is it just, you know, something in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, you know, is it, is it you know, for, for Orthodox Jews, religious Jews, or do Christians have a connection to the Shema as well? We're going to be speaking a lot in Matthew 22, this chapter, but you know I like to speak in context. I don't like to just jump on a verse because it, it just, you, there's no way to understand the heart of God, to even understand the scripture. You cannot, it is impossible to understand a verse without reading it in context. doesn't matter what the verse is, even the Shema. You've got to read in context at least Deuteronomy 6, 1 to at least 9. Just even a little context. you just got to wrap some scripture around it. So, verses 15 to 40, we're not going to read all of it, no way. But in chapter 22 of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, it's a section of questions. There's a section of questions recording three attempts by three different groups, delegations, if you will, who are coming to Yeshua to trap him. Okay? They're not coming because they really you know, want knowledge. There are people, I've just got to tell you, I've met them for years now. They, they take out their Bible and they say on guard. They don't mean it, but they're, they're looking to fight you. When I see that in a Christian brother or sister, I just grab their Bible and I say, put it back in the sheath. I'm gone. Because I don't want to fight a brother. It's lunacy to fight a brother. If you want to sit down and intelligently and humbly and legitimately analyze and discuss the scriptures as a brother would another brother, I'm there. But the minute I see you coming to attack or try to prove a point or show your, your point of view is definitely more important than anybody else's point of view, discussion's over. Because it's not a discussion at that point. It's a fight. And as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we shouldn't be fighting, correct? So I just, I just don't go there. I really... I'm, I don't have, I used to have more energy to do it. I don't have the energy to do it. I have just so much energy and I'd rather spend it with the law, sharing the gospel, than fighting with a brother over a technicality. Just my, just, just me, okay? Anyway, here's three delegations and we're going to look at these three groups, okay? Group one is made up of some of the Pharisees' disciples. The Pharisees were a little full of themselves. They don't even send themselves. They don't even show up themselves. They send some of their students, you know? <laughs> And so they send some of the disciples along with the Herodians. The Pharisees and the Herodians didn't get along, okay? You might be saying, I don't even know who the Herodians are. You've read it eight million times in the scriptures. You should know a little bit about who they are. Is it important? I think so. The Pharisees were a layman's group, okay? They weren't highly trained as some people think. They were just a layman's group, and they were very popular with the common people. The common people of Israel loved the Pharisees. And they were very, very connected to the synagogue, which gave them their power and their authority. They held to the Tanakh, which was the Old Testament. The Tanakh is an acronym for the Torah, the Ketuvim, and the Nevim, which means the first five books, the prophets, and the writings, the whole Old Testament. They held to that. But they had some extra biblical teachings as, long as, as well as some traditions, okay? Those were the Pharisees. The Herodians were just a loosely organized group. 
and that sought to advance the political and economic influence of the family of Herod. They disappeared when the family of Herod disappeared, so they're of no consequence. But let's look at their question. This is their question, Matthew 22, verse 17. Okay? This is what, this is the Pharisee students and the Herodians. They come together because even though they're warring factions, what do we know about Satan? Demons never fight. Demons are totally unified. They get along well. Only Christians fight. So tell us your opinion. And listen, some of you here for the first time, some of you are, you know, a blood-bought Baptist. Listen to me. When I say Christians, I include myself. Body of Messiah. When I say the church, that's the body of Messiah. That's not a church versus the Messianic community. I don't believe for a minute, you missed the boat if you think this, that it's us and them. It's us. Okay? We might have a little different approach on some things, but we came through the same door with the same blood on it. You hit me? You follow? Okay? So it's us. All right? I know that's hard to get the point across in this town. You know, they still think, well, they worship on Saturday, so I can't have anything to do with them. Jesus worshiped on Saturday and have something to do with him. Anyway, so tell us your opinion. This is what they're saying to Yeshua. They're looking to trap him, understand that. Okay, they're having a hard time because at this point, he's got the common people on his side. And they're not happy with that because they have their own system of religion. No different than it is today. There's a systematic theology sometimes in religion, some doctrinal issues that are really man-made. So tell us, they say to Yeshua, does Torah, because there's no New Testament written, right? There's no New Testament written. This is just happening, okay? And they say Torah, which, of course, every Jew held close to the first five books. So he says, so tell us your opinion. Does Torah permit paying taxes to the Roman emperor or not? Some of your versions say, does the Torah or the law, right? It's synonymous. There's the law, the first five books, tell us, permit us, or promote us to pay taxes to Caesar, Right? So that's the question, and then here's the answer. Matthew 22, 19 through 21, he says, show me the coin, because the verse before he says, go get a coin. This is, you got to understand, this is so incredibly brilliant. This is off the charts brilliance. <laughs> show me the coin to use to pay the tax. So they brought him a denarius, you know what the denarius is? To day's wages, it was the most common coin in the Roman Empire, okay? Very, very common. Like if we said, show me a quarter, all right? Show me a denarius. And he asked them, whose name and picture are these? Who do you see on there? Whose name and picture? So they say, the empress, Caesar's, they replied. So Yeshua said to them, new, which is a very Jewish term. David Stern throws in the complete Jewish Bible. It's not necessary, but new means, okay. Duh, new is duh. <laughs> new, yeah, new is just 2,000 year old duh. In other words, so, so, like, and he said it like that. I'm telling you. He said, like, okay, so if his name and his picture and his inscription is on it, then give to him the coin. You know what's crazy though? In the Christian world, what do they always say? Give to Caesar what Caesar's, and they never finish the verse. Yes or no? Yes. Talk to me, Christians. Do they finish the verse? You're crazy to not finish the verse. Because that's not the message. The message is, then whose image is on you? Are you born again? Then the law is written on your heart. Is the spirit in you? Were you not made in God, Zelim, his image? It says in Genesis, you were made in his image. Then dang it, give to God what's God's. That's the message. Pay taxes, man. Pay your taxes. It's right. But are you giving to God your whole heart? Where's your heart? Is it divided? Who's got your heart? That was the message. So what does he do to them? Just see ya. By Pharisee disciples, by Herodians, and you don't hear much about them these days anyway, do you? No, but you hear a lot about Yeshua. Gone. So, what happens? 
Once the Pharisees, disciples, and the Herodians are shut down, along comes group two, the Sadducees. They were not among the common people. They were primarily very wealthy, priestly families in Jerusalem. But they were the liberal theologians of the day. So whatever you think of liberal today, those were the Pharisees of yesteryear. They derived their authority from the temple because they were from the priestly families, and they drew exclusively on the Pentateuch. They did not have extra-biblical teachings. However, they denied things like the resurrection. Some of the things, angelic visitations, it's not important. Mainly, they denied the resurrection. So here comes their question. Look at Matthew 22, 24, 28. It's more like a resurrection riddle, if you will. Okay? Rabbi, they give him that distinction because he was. He was a teacher and he had disciples. There was thousands of rabbis back then. Rabbi, Moshe said, meaning the Torah, if a man dies childless, his brother must marry his widow and have children to preserve the, family's, the man's family's line. Right? Where do we read that in the Torah? Deuteronomy. Good. Chapter? 25, good, 5 through 6. It really, 5 through 10 is the section. Why? Because it's so important to have offspring in Judaism. And it's so important to teach them God's ways so God would have more soldiers giving him glory. So if a man dies, sadly enough, childless, then his brother or her brother-in-law would fulfill the obligation to bear a child so that his name could carry on. I'm the last Hirschberg there is, so... If there was a war even in the United States, I could, I could back out. I could back out just to preserve the family line. That's, that's a law that the United States government has when it comes to war. There were seven brothers. Again, they're trying to trap them. There were seven brothers. The first one married, and then he died. Since he had no children, he left his widow to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and the third, and finally to all seven. So all seven died. They all married her, though. After them all, the woman died. Now in the resurrection, they don't believe in the resurrection. So they're trying to stump him with a riddle. Of the seven, whose wife will she be? It's a good question, right? Who's, who's the lucky man? Or well, depending on who she was, maybe the unlucky man. I don't know. <laughs> For they all married her. And his, his answer... Yeshua answered them, the reason you go astray, the reason you depart from the scripture, is that you are ignorant, imbecilic, untrained, unknowledgeable. You got a couple of verses on your refrigerator, but you don't know how to study the scripture. You're ignorant to both the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and of the power of God. Now he's attacking their resurrection myth and their riddle. For in the resurrection, neither men nor women will marry. I know there's at least somebody going, then bring on the resurrection, right? <laughs> in other words, he's saying in the resurrection, the kingdom to come, there won't, there won't be marriage. It says, rather they will be like angels in heaven. Look, just as a side note, in heaven there's going to be no pain, no sorrow, no tears. Hey, you're going to have marriage. Be careful, guys. Don't laugh. You'll get it on the way home. (laughs) And as to whether the dead are resurrected, haven't you read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is God, not of the dead, but of the living. Listen, they didn't know the scriptures. Isaiah 26 says, the dead shall rise. Job says, my Redeemer lives and I will see him in bodily form. Daniel 12 says some will resurrect to everlasting life and some to everlasting perdition. It says so in the Tanakh. This isn't some new wave aftershave New Testament theory. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They were ignorant to the scriptures. Just like many are ignorant to the scriptures today. We're spending way too much time wasting time on social media and not enough time with the Lord. And you will not learn about the Lord unless you read his word, period. Amen. It's your call, though. I'm not, I know you think, wow, that just convicted me because I spent so much time. Look, 
I care, but I don't care. Knock yourself out. You're going to do whatever you want. Don't you know that? I'm going to do whatever I want. You're going to do whatever you want. But for you that has a soul cry, for you that's saying, I want to draw so close to God. I want to hear his voice. I want to feel intimacy and oneness. I'm telling you how to do it. But if you don't want that, don't worry about it. You made your profession, you're in. So now the Sadducees are shut down. So we got the Pharisees, disciples, and Herodians. They're done. The Sadducees come in, the wealthy ecclesiastical priestly family. They're done. So what happens? When the Pharisees hear that Yeshua silenced the antagonist, they didn't get along. Nothing's new under the sun. The Pharisees didn't like the Sadducees. Sadducees didn't like the Herodians. It's the same thing today. When the Pharisees heard that Yeshua had silenced their time, go back. I'll tell you when to move. When the Pharisees heard that Yeshua had silenced their antagonists, the Sadducees, they decide to send in their big gun. And who's their big gun? What do we do when we're in trouble today? We call a lawyer. So they send in a legal expert, an expert in the Mosaic law. Some of your scriptures say a scribe, a scribe and a lawyer, and an expert in the Mosaic law were all synonymous, okay, just so you know. And he comes to ask a she'elah, which is a very technical Jewish term. It has to do with halakha about Jewish law and how to walk it out. So here you go, Matthew 22, 34 to 36. When the Pharisees, the Pharisees, learned that they had silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees, they got together. Huddle up. And one of them, who was a Torah expert, the Torah expert probably, their best man, they sent in their big gun. He asked this question about Jewish law. Rabbi, which of the mitzvot, which of the commandments in the Torah is the most important? Now, the legal expert, to me, is, in my opinion, asks a great question because there's 613 mitzvot. And he's asking, you know, it's hard. You know, the, the system was like, a, like an obstacle course. It still is for some people that are trying to obey it. People are like, well, which ones are still enforced? Listen, there are rules for, for kings. There's six commandments for kings. Clearly, you're not a king, so they don't apply. There's commandments for women that don't apply to you men. Well, that's probably changing. But anyway, it doesn't apply, right? There are rules in the land of Israel. You don't live in the land of Israel, so it's hard for you to figure it out. And it was hard for them to figure out. So he's asking a very, very good question. Which, which commandment is the most important? Like, let me bottom line this thing. Help me bottom line it. Okay? And this was not a strange question. It's not out of the ordinary. You might think that's a weird question. That's out of the ordinary. Not in the first century it wasn't. And why is it important to know what's going on in the first century? The book was written by Jews to Jews in a Jewish land. So if you don't understand Jewish culture, trust me, you're going to not understand a lot of it. Amen. Amen. Just the truth. Just like when I go to India, or I go to Africa, I go to Asia, whatever it is, there's culture that I have to understand in order to understand what they're saying to me. You follow? Okay, so it's not a strange question because in Judaism there was this ongoing debate to determine which of the laws are heavy and which of the laws are light. How do I know that? Look at Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, hypocritical Torah teachers and perishim. You pay your tithes of mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of Torah. So are there least and greatest? Are there light and heavy? They asked Yeshua, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? He didn't say there's no such thing. He said, you who are the most humble. He says in Matthew 5, you who teach the least of these, not to obey the least of these commandments, will be considered least in the kingdom. There are least and heavy. People say sin is sin. Not true. Sin is sin, but not every sin is equal. It's just not true. You've heard people say that? It's not true. It's just some man-made doctrine. It's not true. Now, on a side note, now you know in 15 years I've never preached on tithing. Why? I never preached on not killing anybody either. There's no reason to. It's pretty straightforward. Don't kill, tithe. But... I know that the church, the body of Messiah, doesn't do it. I don't count. I don't know. I don't know who gives what. I decided to. I didn't want to know. But of course, we know that 95 to 98% of the church community doesn't tithe. And there are teaching out there like, well, that was Old Testament. Not according to this, it's not. <laughs> he says, you tithe. You tithe, even down to your herbs. And what does he say? 
These are the things you should have attended to without neglecting the others. What are the others? Guys, it's grammar. What are the others? What are the others? Tithing. No, you're not reading it. This is grammar. Look. Woe to you, Torah teachers and perishim. You pay your tithes. You tithe. But you have neglected justice, mercy, and trust. These are the things, meaning justice, mercy, and trust, grammar, you should have attended to without neglecting tithing. So for the people that are teaching you, it's Old Testament, they're teaching you wrong, and this is out of Yeshua's mouth. So why do you need to have a series on it? What would Jesus do? He tithe. Do I care if you tithe? I could care less. I care less. God's always provided. I don't need to tithe. Do we tithe? Of course. Why wouldn't we? Let's continue. God, it got really silent in here. <laughs> People get really uptight when it comes to money, don't they? Yes. Yeah, that's my money. Sure is. Sure is. Okay, so here's the question that the lawyer asks in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six. This is the $64,000 question, right? This is what our lesson is really all about. Rabbi, which of the mitzvot in the Torah is the most important? And here's his answer. Matthew 22, 37 to 38. He told him, this is, he is Yeshua, him is the legal expert. That's why you got to read in context and you got to know grammar. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This is the greatest and most important commandment. What is he saying? Deuteronomy 6.5. How could you say in your flagrant imagination that he's nailed that to the cross when he's saying that's the most important command? Now, I don't believe for a minute that a Christian or a pastor believes in their heart that he's nailed the Ten Commandments to the cross. But they say it. And then they also say, but obey the commandments. It sounds like spiritual schizophrenia. They don't mean, they don't mean, you're not going to ask a pastor like, so, so can, we, can we commit adultery? Can we steal? Can we? No, of course not. So what did he nail to the cross? Sin. He didn't get nailed for the law. He got nailed for sin. It wasn't the laws that went on him. It was our sins that went on him. And sin is lawlessness. Therefore, if we're born again, we should be more lawful, not more lawless. But the issue isn't, the problem isn't with the law. It says the law is holy, just, and good. The problem is with us. And until we delight in God's ways, we're not going to obey him. If we have a checklist, say, I got to do this, I got to do that, forget it. When somebody comes to me and says, Rabbi, do I have to? I'm like, you already, forget it. You already missed it. You should want to. You should delight in the ways of God. You should delight in the ways of God. The laws of God should be a delight, a delight. David said seven times a day, seven times a day he got on his knees and said, I delight in your ways. He learned the hard way, didn't he? Yeah. He killed a man, committed adultery. I mean, he nailed them all. But he also was called a man after God's heart because he got it. He got it. Better late than never, right? So he gives him the Shema, like, what? Do you mean to tell me whether you're an Old Testament saint? I know there's some people, too, in the book that think they're not going to see Moses in heaven. Moses might not see you in heaven if you have that attitude. Because <laughs> you're wrong. <laughs> you're very wrong. They didn't have the Messiah back then, so they had works of righteousness. So, so whether you're an Old Testament saint, Rabbi, or a New Covenant believer, a Christian, the Shema is still in force? Is Yeshua speaking with a forked tongue? Guys, this is a, I'm not trying to badger the witness. You might think, Rabbi, well, this is, it's, it's very hard to do what I do. Not as a pastor, because I'm in the middle of Christian Central. I'm supposed to be a Jew. The Jews are like, you're weird because you believe in Jesus. The Christians are like, you're weird because you worship on Saturday. And everybody thinks I'm weird. And yet God says, good on you. You're supposed to be weird. And it's very hard to pull these two groups together. Because the Jews are looking at the Christians saying, you guys are flagrant, you're crazy. You'd say, nail the Lord to the cross. The law is beautiful, it's holy, just, and good. The Christians saying to them, but you're crazy because you can't fulfill it all and you need the Messiah. You need both. You need both. 
Okay? The laws of God are holy, just, and good. Just ask somebody who's been betrayed. So according to him, yes. Now, I believe, who cares what you believe? I don't blame you for feeling that way. <laughs> really, I, so, I don't really, I usually don't care what I believe. I, very rare. You know, some of you here 15 years, I never tell you what I believe. Almost never. I just talk about the scriptures. You know that. I, I never, but... I want you to see something maybe that I see, but if you don't see it, just go, no problem, no problem. I believe Yeshua was trying to show the scribes and the Torah teachers their utter spiritual bankruptcy. I do believe that. And I believe that Yeshua was trying to show the scribes and the Torah teachers their desperate need for a Savior. Without a doubt. Because in reality... Has there ever been a person or will there ever be a person that loves God with all their heart and all their mind and all their strength all the time? I believe he was doing that. Because without, without the cleansing of sin and the indwelling or empowering presence of the Holy Spirit, loving God to any degree is virtually impossible. Virtually impossible. And, and although we need a Savior, and most of you, if not all of you, are absolutely saved, we also need to take seriously the command to love God with all our heart, soul, and strength. To those who do, to those of you who do, I don't know who they are, it's, it's not my business to know. I don't want to know. But to those who do, who take that seriously, who take that command seriously to love God with all their heart. It's those who are consumed with God. They're consumed with God. They can't stop thinking about Him. They want to wake up early. They don't want to sleep in. There's no snooze button. They don't need an alarm. They have an internal alarm from the Holy Spirit. And they get up, and the minute they get up, they attack the Bible and they attack prayer. They get excited to read his word. They get excited about some other things, but no. You know, when I go places to see things, it's like, no matter how great it is, I'm like, I can't wait till tomorrow morning. I don't like to sleep because I can't wait till the morning when all is quiet and everybody's sleeping. And it's like, Papa, you know, I get so excited. Ask my wife, ask my kids. If I don't have to open the door, open the door to my house and just start screaming to not wake them up. Am I? Yes. <laughs> yes. Did it happen this morning? Specifically. Linda, is Linda here? Is my name here? Do you ever hear me? You're probably so in a fog, you don't even know what the heck's going on. But like in the I get so excited that I'm going to read his word when I get up that I literally open the door closed and just go, woo, woo. I got to get it out, because when I come in, I'll do it, and then I'll wake them up, and they'll get all mad. Just the slamming of the door didn't do it. Right. <laughs> I can't explain it, but some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you, don't, you can't explain it. I mean, I, I could try to explain it, but I really can't, so I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try. There's no explanation for it, okay? To those who, that are consumed, they get so excited, they're eager to pray. They love to pray for their family and their congregation. And they pray for those who are being persecuted around the world and say, Father, I know some of them are being tortured right now as I'm praying. They're in some horrible prison cell being beat. Give them strength. Give them your presence. Send them an angelic visitation, just like an act. Send it to them so they see it's worthy. It's worth it. Promote your cause around the world. Father, I pray for our country that it be one nation under God. I pray for our leaders that they make righteous decisions. Father, I pray for my extended family, my sisters and my cousins and my nieces and nephews that somehow they search for you and you in your infinite mercy would reveal yourself to them just like you did to me who wasn't deserving. And they get pumped about sharing the good news. They get pumped. Because they, they're not looking to win a soul because they're weeping over souls. They're a weeper of soul, not a winner of souls. 
It's these. It's those people that the love for God grows and the knowledge for God grows and the grace of God grows. The grace of God. They understand. They get deeper and deeper revelation every day about that cross, that execution stake. More and more deeper revelation, and they get deeper revelation of the power of God, the resurrection power of God. So Yeshua here, masterfully, and I say masterfully as only the master can do, summarizes man's obligation to God as the first and greatest commandment with the Shema. We ought to love God with all our hearts, souls, and strength. Okay? Okay, Rabbi. We're done, right? Not exactly. <laughs> Almost. But we left out a verse. Verse 39. What about verse 39? He says, before you go, and before you go, before you go, there's a second one similar, meaning it's like the same. It's, it's just about the same. What? It's just about the same. What? It's just about the same. You want to love your neighbor as yourself. What? Leviticus? I thought that was a skin ailment. You get little kids in church and they go, Mom, I think I have a Leviticus. Call the dermatologist. Leviticus 19.18. What? So he's, he's saying the Shema and the Viahafta. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, for any of you who have been around the Messianic community for long, but do you notice how grandiose the Shema is? I mean, some of our, some of our cantors in the movement, I mean, they're like, Shema Yisrael. Very grandiose, right? Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. And then we move to the other one, and it's like, Yehafter or Echad, whatever. Right? Right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And love your neighbor, who cares? Right? Why is that? Because we suck at it. We do. I know people in the movement that pride themselves on lighting their candles at 647, but they don't like people. They don't like people. I'm like, what were you baptized in? Lemon juice? You're ornery. You hear them. All I know is I got Jesus in my heart. Which one? Yikes. Seems like a real angry Jesus in your heart. Leviticus 19 is a beautiful chapter about ethical conduct and laws for everyday life. For instance, for instance, basic, humane, and sensitive treatment of others, like the aged, the handicapped, or the physically challenged, whatever works today. The poor. It says the labor is to be promptly paid. Don't do that nonsense. Somebody works for you, it's 5 o'clock, pay them. Don't say, I can pay tomorrow or next week as they leave your 6,000 square foot home and they get in their 20-year-old Honda. Pay them. And you know what? It wouldn't kill you to pay them a little more, would it? Yeah. Cheapskate, what's 100 bucks to you? You'll change their life. The stranger is to be treated with the same love we treat our fellow citizens. Meaning there is no such thing as a stranger in our community. And you ready for this? Vengeance and grudge bearing is condemned. Amen. Guys, there's very little in the law about honoring God. It says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Have no other gods before me. And then it's all about us. Because what the Torah is doing is protecting me from you. And it's protecting you from me.
It's teaching us how to get along and be mutually beneficial to one another. Can you imagine if we really came together and helped each other? This is God's heart. He's a blesser. He's not as angry as some of you think. There's times, yes, he disciplines, but he disciplines out of his love, always out of his love. His discipline is birthed out of his love. Everything he does is birthed out of love because God is. If we truly want to love God, we, I know people that say, I love God. Listen to me. The Bible says, if you love God but hate your brother, you're not wrong, you're a liar. Because if you can't love, if you love what you don't see, if you claim to love what you don't see, how can you love what you, you, you see the person? It's easy to say, I love God. How easy is it to say, I love God? Oh, I love God. I'm so in love with God. But I don't want to go to a church because I hate people. So I'm going to stay home. And I'm not going to interact with anybody. If it, it's so easy to say I love God. You know why? Because we know God won't hurt us. We're convinced of that, right? God would never hurt me. He would never do anything. We're convinced that's our theology. People, on the other hand, will hurt you. But you've hurt people. It works both ways. You're not as angelic as people think you are. Nobody's perfect. And we have to learn. We have to come together and iron. Sometimes you're around a difficult person. You go like, they're so difficult. You know why they're difficult? To whittle you down and teach you how to not be offended. They're a plant by the kingdom. You know what marriage is about? You know what it's really about? Yes, it's wonderful and it's not good for man to be alone. But it's God's crucible. You learn in a marriage, if you do it God's way, to die to yourself. Yeah. When I meet people and they're thinking about getting married and I, I ask them, do you find yourself selfish? I recommend they not do it unless they're willing to get out of themselves because it won't work. It will not work. You can marry somebody who's very servile and obsequious and they do whatever you want and you think you have a good marriage. They're going to explode. One day they're going to explode on you. You're going to see and you're like, what happened? You know, why did you stab me 25 times? Because <laughs> they came to their senses. It's all about dying to yourself. Now listen, if we truly want to love God, then we should love what he loves. If we truly, truly want to love God, then we should love what he loves. And what does God love? Look at John 3, 16. God so loved the world, not the world's ways, not the world's ways, not the world's system, not the world's literature, not the world's dress, but look at what the word means, loved, is to be fond of, agapeo. Very few people walk in this. When Yeshua asked Peter, do you love me? He didn't say, do you agapeo me? He said, do you phileo me? Meaning, do you, do you like me a lot? And Peter kept on saying, you know I like you a lot. And finally, when he asked him this question, Peter's like, man, nobody loves like God. But, but even though it's a tall order, we got to give it a shot. We're called to give it a shot. And if it was easy, then everybody would be a believer. It's not supposed to be easy. And it takes a lifetime to learn. A lifetime to learn. To love dearly. God's saying he loves the world dearly. What's the world? The word cosmos, which we get the cosmos from. It's the universe, but he's not talking about the universe. It's also the inhabitants of the earth, but he's not talking about the inhabitants of the earth. The ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God, and hostile to the cause of Christ. You want me to love them? He did. That's what it says. And he said, forgive them, Father. They're clueless. They don't know what they're doing. And then Stephen says it, and it brought Yeshua to his feet. The only time we know of Yeshua giving anybody a standing ovation. Look, it goes back to the very beginning, guys. Look at Genesis 131. God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Now, hold on. This is day what? Genesis 131 is day what? I'll give you a hint. It's one more than five. It's one less than seven. It's day six. Okay? Every other thing he made, every other thing he made, 
you know, the mountains and the, and the animals and, and the waterfalls, beautiful. He said it was good. But this day, he changes his tune. Day six, all of a sudden, he looks back and he goes, this isn't just good. He said, it's very good. Why did he say that? Look at the word good. Everything he made, he said, was tov. He pronounced it in Hebrew, tov. Everything he made was excellent. Everything God made was delightful. Everything God made was worthy and magnificent and majestic and choice and his umpteen words. But on the sixth day, it wasn't just excellent, and it wasn't just delightful, and it wasn't just worthy and choice and magnificent. It was meod tov. It was exceedingly excellent. It was excessively excellent. It was extremely excellent. Why? Turn to the right and the left. You're looking at them. Because, see, we were not birthed to be selfish. And we were not birthed to hurt people. We were birthed to heal and give of ourselves. And you change lives. You have the ability, guys, you have the ability, no matter what your sphere of influence is, to absolutely change a person's life. You have the ability to make a person want to go. You have that ability. And I don't think it's a sin, but it's a crying shame when you don't use that ability. Now, let me just interject something before we leave. There is a huge, ginormous difference between nice and kind. Living here 15 years, I've met a ton of nice people. Now, I will grant you, up in the Northeast, it's rough. It's rough. It's, it's, it's intense. Uh, people will, will come at you. You know, there's 8 million people on an island. I mean, they, Gilligan couldn't even get along with the captain, and there were six of them. You put 8 million people on an island, and you're going to have a lot of shucking and jiving and elbowing, and you know what I mean? It's just, it's just like that. I mean, when I first moved here, there was a, a bagel shop, and I'm still, but, but it's calmed me down a lot since I left New York, but there's a bagel shop. Stay with me. Hello? You awake? Get up and just shake yourself. <laughs> there was a bagel shop and a legitimate bagel shop. The water boiling method, like in New York, right? What was it called? Chesapeake Bagel. And the first morning I go in there because I'm like, wow, I can't believe it. I'm in Macon, Georgia, and I can get a real deal bagel. So I go in, and there's one lady online at 7 o'clock, and she's going like this. Well, I had a blueberry yesterday, and I'm like, I'm ready to just grab her by the nape of the neck and go, shh. I, I, I don't have time for you to have a conversation. I got to go to work. I got things to do. It, it, so it's, it's fast-paced. It's crazy. But listen to me, you guys. There is a vast difference between nice and kind. And let me let you in on it because I don't believe for a millisecond Jesus was nice or would anybody ever say he was nice. And I hope nobody ever says Rabbi Greg is nice, which I'm sure many of you do. <laughs> Kindness emerges from someone who is confident, someone who is compassionate, and someone who is comfortable with themselves. Kindness. A kind person is loving and gives out of the goodness of their heart. Niceness, on the other hand, is rooted in feelings of inadequacy and the need to get approval from others. Over, overly nice people try to please others so they can feel good about themselves. Kind people have no ulterior motives, and they don't care what people think. Kind people can also be quite assertive. Nice people, on the other hand, bend over backward to be obliging. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They deal with potential conflicts by placating the other person because they can't deal with anybody being upset with them. Nice people explode. They're passive aggressive, they get in codependent relationships and they explode. At some point they just lose it because they've never learned how to deal with conflict in a right way. Look at what it says in Matthew 22. We were just reading the whole section before, 15, 16. It says, Then the perishing, the Pharisees went away and put together a plan to trap Yeshua with his own words. 
They sent him some of his students, Talmudin, and some members of Herod's party. They said, Rabbi, we know that you tell the truth and really teach what God's way is. You aren't concerned. <laughs> he was so consumed with God. Of course he was loving. Niceness is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's BS is what it is. It's not real. It's not real. Kindness is one of the fruits. Of, it's birthed out of love. But when somebody loves somebody so much, they have a, 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 an obligation to be honest. They have an obligation to be genuine and be authentic. They have an obligation to tell the truth. And yes, people want the truth. But they, they can't. Most people can't handle the truth. And that's why they struggle in relationships. A relationship goes great until the other person disagrees. And it's almost like, well, we'll get along great as long as you do everything I want, when I want, how I want. And we'll have a great relationship. You're not in a relationship. It, it takes time and compromise and whittling down and changing, and that's part of a relationship. But I... I don't think Yeshua was nice, but I think he was kind. And I think he was genuine. And I think he was so blatantly and lovingly honest that he would never hoodwink anybody or manipulate a soul. Because truth doesn't do that. It doesn't manipulate. As much as we might not like to focus on it, I think we should ponder frequently the words, love your neighbor as yourself. We should think of how very much we love ourselves and how much of our activity centers around the care and comfort of self. Do you ever realize how much you're consumed or we're consumed with ourself? How much we plan our days around ourself? How much we planned our weeks around ourself, our lives around ourself? And we say, I'm too busy to do anything because I'm so consumed with myself. Now, some of you have families, and we have a family, and I understand it takes a lot of time and effort to keep a family on the straight and narrow. So I'm not saying to you, hey, you need to get away from your family, but sometimes it could be very depressing to just focus on self. Helping others is the antidote for depression, especially those who are less fortunate than yourself. And I'm not saying to give of yourself and deny your family, I'm saying let the Holy Spirit direct you. Don't let me direct you or anybody else. Don't get caught up in a ministry because you think it looks good. So I got a ministry to the homeless, and I could tell everybody about that ministry, so I get some kudos. Let the Lord lead you. If it's even today, and you're out somewhere, and he's leading you to go talk to somebody at a table where you're eating, let it happen. Don't look for it to happen. The Holy Spirit will speak to you loud and clear. I promise. If you're connected with God, and you're in relationship with God, and you have an intimate connection with him, he will speak loud and clear, and it will be undeniable what you're supposed to do. And it is not for me to tell you, and it is not for you to tell me. Let the Holy Spirit be spirit-filled and spirit-led. Let the Spirit of God guide your path and guide your life. So what's the message? The message is the same message Yeshua preached 2,000 years ago. It's never going to change. And it's Matthew 7, 12. Always treat others as you would like them to treat you. For that sums up. Or some say all the law and the prophets hang on that. I mean, if Yeshua was married, what kind of husband do you think he would be? If he had kids, what kind of father do you think he would be? If he was an employee, what kind of employee would he be? If he was an employer, you think he'd be cheap? Look, this is the golden rule. The golden rule was coined by an author. You might know him, Charles Gibbon, 1604, but Philo of Alexandria spoke these words. Not exactly a derivative. Aristotle, Socrates, Bob in Alabama, they call him Socrates. Socrates, <laughs> Confucius, the Buddha, all these great religious men spoke this derivative. But where does it all come from? Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus 19.18, right? It all comes back to the Torah. The Torah, guys, 
The Torah to me isn't so much a checklist. It's on my heart. The laws of God, the ways of God, the heart of God. God's heart should be impressed on your heart. They should beat as one. And I can't get it right all the time. I mean, I just can't get it right all the time. You can't get it right all the time. Sometimes, I had a, a young man come to visit me this week. He just wanted to come and visit with me, and he's, he's, he's going to be off somewhere. And I could just tell this kid is so tenderhearted, and he loves God so much, and he wants to please God all the time. I could tell the minute he walked in my office, there was such a legitimacy of it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You want to please God so much, and you want to do the right thing all the time, right? And I could see it, and I could see almost that at times he could be under a condemnation from himself and from the enemy when he falls short. But I told him what it says in, in Isaiah, where, where God is speaking through Isaiah to the children of Israel. And sometimes he'll, he'll let you make your choices, and there will be a disaster, and you'll come to that conclusion, this was a disaster, I was foolish. But then it says God longs to show you his grace. Meaning, the second you turn and legitimately apologize, that's when grace starts flowing from the heart of God. There's not a probation period. There's not like, look, we've been through this before, okay? There's just a, a cooling off period. Go to your room. We do that. I get it. But with God, see, God is love. And it's pure love. And the grace of God comes out of the heart of God instantaneously. We can't accept that. You know why? Because we don't know how to do it. So we can't wrap our minds around it. So we can't even accept that from God. It's almost humbling and it's belittling and it's almost like, I, I can't, I don't want your grace like that. Because what does it do to us? It convicts us. Because we have such a hard time forgiving people. And we have such a hard time of letting go of memory when somebody did something to us wrong 25 years ago. But if we're going to be legitimate believers, put Shabbat, put the feast, put the kashrut, put it all aside, we must learn how to forgive. And we must learn how to be loving. And this is what the Shema is all about. It's not about checking off some laws and feeling like you're better than somebody else. And it's the greatest thing, isn't it, to extend forgiveness and to be forgiven. It's the greatest thing to truly look at somebody in the eye and say, I forgive you. And if you ever have trouble with that, just try to remember all your sins and just, just go to the cross and say, you did all this for me. You did all this for me. All God wants us to do is pay it forward. He's not looking to be paid back. Nobody can pay him back. We could just pay him forward. And with all the doctrine and all the theology and all the revelation, study. I'm okay with it, guys, but listen to me. This is what Jesus said. They will know you belong to me by the way you love each other. And he said we have to love our brothers. And then he said we have to love our neighbors. And then he had the audacity to say we have to love our enemies. So it's all inclusive. Are we done? Not exactly. Next week, we're going to wrap up the Shema, okay? If you want to study a little bit, study the Good Samaritan. That's where we're going to go. Who's my neighbor? Luke 10, you read it, study it, break down the words, come in with some stuff, okay? Maybe you can be like, you're wrong, Rabbi. <laughs> I'll take it. Let's stand together, guys. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, guys. And don't be nice.